Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, fifth town hall that we've held on the COVID virus. My name is Bob Griffin. I'm the Dean of the College of Emergency Preparedness, Homeland Security, and Cybersecurity here at the University of Albany. Thank you for being with us tonight. On behalf of President Rodriguez and Provost Kim, thank you for attending. And remember, um, you can start to submit your questions and the, the Q&A tab that is at the bottom of your Zoom bar. Um, uh, before I get into tonight's lineup, um, I, I want to, uh, I, I want to, I'm very excited about next week's show. I'm very excited about tonight's show. I'm very excited about next week's show as well. Next week, we have um, some doctors from Shanghai General Hospital who actually responded to, to Wuhan, who uh, have been following our our town hall and, and uh, uh, in YouTube clips. And um, we'll get a perspective of, of how things were handled in Wuhan as we start to think about a more global perspective. Um, but tonight, in addition to the always amazing Dean David Holkray from the School of, of Public Health, I'm really pleased to, to announce that Dr. Julie Novak from our own Rockefeller College is here to talk about some of the constitutional issues and, and federalism, federalism issues that are um, that are starting to pop up. And, and, and Dr. Novak, thank you. Uh, Novak, thank you so much for being here to, uh, with us tonight. Really appreciate it. I also would like to have a special call out to, to, to Dean Carl Rithmeyer, uh, again, a, another one of our um, uh, Dean Holgraves of mine's peer, but a big supporter of, of everything you do and, and certainly our town meeting. Um, as I have said in, on multiple occasions, and we'll continue to say, um, this is an, an opportunity for discourse. It's an opportunity for you to ask questions that you may not be able to, to get answers to or, or issues that are not being picked up by the mainstream press um, or alternate press. Um, so please feel free to ask questions. What's happening behind us is we have a whole host of faculty members um, from the University of Albany who are answering questions as the, the podcast, as this show continues. So, so don't wait, put your questions in now. Um, finally, again, and, and I, I have to drive this point home, um, hate the virus, love the people. Uh, remember, as I continue to say, whether it's your own family, um, whether it's your extended family, whether it's your UAlbany family, take some time to practice some random acts of kindness. Um, that's what keeps us together as a community. And together as a community, we are strong enough to see ourselves through any situation. So with that said, let me turn it over to Dean Holtgrave for an update. Dean? Great. Thank you very much, Dean Griffin. It's always a pleasure to be with you and we look forward to these town halls uh, literally every week so it's really uh, terrific and uh, thank um, Provost Kim and uh, uh, President Rodriguez and all the faculty students and staff of CEHC and SPH for making time on Monday evenings to be a part of these discussions and also our guests from across the uh, university. Um, so I thought tonight very briefly I would touch on two things. Um, uh, the first of which is whether or not we in New York State have uh, reached an apex or not in terms of the pandemic. And secondly, what, how close are we to the three phases of reopening of the economy uh, that the White House had put out last week? Uh, and so I thought I'd touch base on those uh, three. Also, we have a first question in already, uh, wondering if uh, whether next week we can talk about um, the study of uh, hydroxychloroquine. And so we're hopeful that by the end of the month, uh, we will have um, uh, the final results in for that uh, study. So uh, hopefully next week or certainly the following after that, uh, we'll be able to come back to that. So thanks already for that interest in that question. Um, so the first thing I wanted to touch base on tonight are whether or not we've reached the apex. Um, last week when we were here, uh, I was commenting on how for about six days running, uh, we were at about 770 deaths per day in New York State, and that had been relatively flat. Uh, at about two deaths per minute for almost a week. Um, now from April 14th to 19th, um, the number of deaths uh, is 752, 606, 630, and then 540, 507, and 478. And while clearly every one of those deaths is still a tragedy uh, and to clearly be mourned, um, it, the, uh, it does seem though like we're kind of uh, reached uh, some apex, which in New York State's case was more of a flat mountaintop than a sharp apex. And we seem to be coming down a little bit um, when we look at fatalities. 
Um, also in New York State, um, we see that new hospitalizations every day are coming down somewhat from about um, 2,000 a day to now about 1,500 a day. So that's starting to come down the other side of the mountain a little bit. And intubations are also down a bit every day as well too. And if we look at the reproductive rate, and uh, so many of you know, of course, a reproductive rate of one means that for every case of COVID-19, uh, that person might transmit to one other person. If you have a reproductive rate of two, it's one person transmitting to two people. Or uh, if you get less than one, it means that every case is transmitting to, on average, less than one person. And I think that um, right now in New York State, depending on uh, which calculation um, you look at, whether it's uh, uh, some modeling uh, uh, done by McKenzie and Associates or some of the calculations that our own Eli Rosenberg has done, uh, New York State is probably have a reproductive rate of around uh, 0.9 to one. So we're just getting to the place now uh, where we're starting to maybe hopefully move a little bit less than one. Um, but as the economy starts to reopen, that's going to be important to look at that number, make sure it doesn't creep back over one at any point. So I think we've probably, in terms of uh, fatality uh, rates, probably reached an apex. It was a very flat mountaintop for a while, and now we're maybe uh, coming down the other side. The question is how quickly we'll be able to come down the other side of the mountain. Um, so then that raises the question, of how close are we to uh, reopening the economy? And uh, last week, uh, the White House issued uh, these, uh, this approach to thinking about reopening businesses and so on that has three phases to it. And um, before you ever get to the first phase, and these are more progressively opening of society, before you ever get to the first phase, there's what they call gating criteria. And you're supposed to meet several of these key criteria in order to be able to move to the first phase of reopening. And right now in New York State, although we're making very good progress, uh, we've not yet met all of the gating criteria, and I just want to mention that. So in terms of cases um, in the White House criteria for, for uh, gating to be reopening, you should be down uh, in cases for about 14 days. And we're starting to see that move downward uh, for about the last oh, five or six days in New York State. Uh, but not 14 days yet. Um, but also there's another gating criteria that uh, you, your number of tests should be flat or going up for uh, a prolonged period of time. And then the positivity rate, the number of tests, the number of uh, positive cases divided by the number of tests should be going down. And if we look at New York State, um, uh, on about April 15th, we were about 25,000 tests per day. Now we're at about 15,000 tests per day. So actually the total number of tests per day, uh, according to uh, COVID-19 tracker.health.ny.gov is actually moving down a bit. Um, and if we look at the positivity uh, of cases, um, that's now also going down a bit, but not been going down long enough or fast enough to meet these gating criteria quite yet. And uh, I just wanted to also uh, say too, in that regard, I, I've talked a lot about positivity um, rates of tests when we've had these town halls. Um, if we look at New York City, for instance, uh, their positivity rate is about 47%. So if you uh, get a test in New York City, it's about 47% chance that you would test positive. But of course the tests are mainly reserved still for persons who are healthcare workers or symptomatic hospitalized persons. But if you start to look at that by day, a few days ago, uh, New York City was at a, a positivity rate of about 57 to 59%. As of today, it's about 31%. So we're seeing uh, starting moving in the right direction. We're just not all the way there yet. Uh, for New York State overall, the positivity rate cumulatively um, is at 39%. And uh, Admiral Girard, who works on the White House um, COVID-19 Task Force, recently said in a press release that although there's not a magic number for what the positivity rate should be, if it's 20% or higher, you're maybe testing too little. If it's 1% or so, you're maybe testing too much. And if it's around 10% or so, maybe you're kind of hitting uh, a reasonable amount of testing. So in New York State, uh, we're still sort of in the 30, 40 kind of percent ranges, depending on whether we're talking about the city or the state or, or uh, uh, cumulatively or most recently. Um, but we're still well over that threshold that Admiral Girard was talking about for needing to test even more. So um, important work is going on in New York State, which is to be applauded. 
uh, but there's even more that we can do in regard to rolling tests out. Um, also, when we think about these gating criteria, uh, a requirement is that we have enough um, testing in place to do statistical surveys uh, of asymptomatic persons in the community and to do contact tracing for any tests that are uh, found positive. Um, just today in New York State, they've started a surveillance study where people are randomly being sampled at uh, grocery stores, uh, being offered tests, and then they'll look at what the background community prevalence is. And that's going to be an important advance, uh, but that's just getting underway. Um, uh, also, these gating criteria require uh, that you can have tests for all persons who are symptomatic, regardless of whether or not uh, they're in the hospital. And uh, clearly still in New York, we're uh, ramping that up. We don't yet still have tests for all persons who are symptomatic. So I think in terms of trying to meet these gating criteria to move to the first phase, um, we're probably in New York uh, State, I would guess, uh, at least two, if not more like three or four weeks away uh, from meeting those gating criteria and be able to move on to these different phases. Uh, we could talk through each of those uh, phases. Uh, they're all contained on the White House website under a reopening um, tab, and you might want to look at those there. But I thought the most immediate thing for us in New York State is whether or not we meet the gating criteria to move to that first phase. So we're making great progress. Uh, we've still got a ways to go in order to get to that first phase of reopening. So I think, Dean Griffin, let me stop there and uh, turn it back to you, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dean Hochrave. Um, but before I turn uh, to our next speaker, can you answer me this question? Uh, I, I just saw in the news that um, Georgia announced that they're, they're going to be um, starting to reopen um, a lot of different places, gyms and, and public spaces on, on I believe it's Monday. Um, Texas and Florida have have both followed suit. Um, what is the criteria? What's the public health criteria that they're using to to reopen? And I'm not trying to steal uh, the good doctor's next uh, presentation. I just it's, it's sort of a setup. Yeah, no, I think it's a it's a great uh, question, Bob, because uh, I, I would have to look for each of those um, uh, states uh, whether or not they meet all six of these gating criteria. Uh, but just from what I know, for instance, about Georgia, a um, number of colleagues that work uh, in Georgia, in the state of Georgia, in infectious diseases, and um, they're routinely reporting on issues around access to testing, uh, sufficient um, resources for contact tracing, um, worried about uh, continued expansion uh, of the epidemic in those areas. Um, so I, I would be really worried uh, about whether or not those gating criteria are being met. And uh, again, I'd have to go back and study specifically for those states, but uh, especially for Georgia, uh, it feels to me like uh, it may be a little bit on the premature side uh, to be thinking about moving to that kind of expansion. The other thing I will say is um, if you, uh, one of the things that this pandemic has taught us um, in some other countries is that uh, if you open too soon, you may pay for it in a second and a third wave coming along later. And so if anything, um, you want to hit it exactly at the right uh, time, but if anything, you might want to have your social distancing in place for just a little bit extra period of time, not so long as to hurt the economy, uh, but to make sure that you guard against the second wave just as much as you possibly can. So yes, when I, when I hear news is like uh, beaches reopening and the uh, state of Georgia and so on reopening, uh, I will have to say I'm very worried about that and whether or not we're really ready for that right at this moment in time. But no, thanks for raising that question, Bob. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and, and now it, it's my, 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 as I said, my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Julie Novkoff from Rockefeller. I, I think uh, that the, the doctor is going to get into some of these really um, intricate constitutional and federalism issues. Doctor, thank you again for being here tonight. And I turn, I turn the floor to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very grateful to be here tonight to get a chance to talk with all of you about these really important issues. It's been a very busy and exciting time for those of us who are interested in questions of federalism and constitutional law. Um, we've been seeing things changing uh, often on almost a daily basis, so I'm glad to have the chance to think through this in a concentrated fashion and share some of my thinking with you. Um, what I'm going to do uh, right now is inflict uh, a PowerPoint upon you, um, sadly, uh, if I can just find it here. Yes, um, 
So I'm just going to share my screen and get this running. Um, I've titled this presentation, The, the Perils and Promise of Federalism, uh, because federalism is absolutely key to understanding the constitutional and legal limitations of how this response works. When we think about federalism in the United States, and when we think in specific terms about response to infectious disease, we have to go back in history to before the founding and realize that traditionally states and localities have been the first responders and had the first responsibility for protecting the public health. Indeed, the first major health crisis that the United States experienced as a new nation took place in 1793 in Philadelphia, where there was a major yellow fever outbreak. There was no formal crisis plan, so the mayor was responsible for uh, mobilizing informal volunteers, which included the Free African Society, to deliver food and care for the sick and bury the dead. Likewise, in the 1830s, when there were some cholera outbreaks, uh, a lot of the responses were based in local religious communities and in cities and towns. The first time you see any significant uh, federal administrative capacity coming into the picture is not until around 1866 uh, in the post-Civil War era. There's a, a concentrated federal response to a cholera epidemic at that point. But even as we get on toward the turn of the century with uh, experiences with significant infectious disease outbreaks, a lot of these responses are still primarily and almost exclusively based in uh, cities and states. So when we think about tuberculosis, that was largely a city uh, response uh, with public awareness campaigns and efforts to stem the spread. Likewise with smallpox and efforts to vaccinate people um, and to require vaccination. These were happening at the city and state level because it was understood to be their responsibility. Even in the 1918 pandemic, I'm sure that you've seen these uh, stories going around about different responses in different cities that had better and worse effects in flattening the curve. This uh, underlines the fact that the federal government was really not directing and controlling these responses. Much of it was happening on the state and local level. And this history and tradition continues to have an influence on how these things work today. How However, now we do have more national administrative authority, which provides an overlay and assistance when it comes to dealing with infectious disease. Um, everyone I'm sure is familiar with the CDC, which was formed in 1946 um, as a post-war effort to get a handle on malaria outbreaks and to reach out to try to address malaria overseas. Um, but the CDC formed at that point largely as a federal clearinghouse for diagnostic services, and it expanded into more of an epidemic intelligence service in 1951. As time went on, its scope and agenda grew, and the CDC largely became the shock troops of in infectious diseases for the United States, uh, specializing in epidemiology and collecting data. Uh, they also provided um, information from areas outside of the United States. They were a key factor in a 1958 cholera and smallpox outbreak in what was then uh, East, East Pakistan, now Bangladesh. And in 1961, CDC initiated the um, MMR, the Weekly Report on Mortality and Morbidity, which collects data from all of the states to produce these reports. So it has become a clearinghouse where major diseases are addressed and monitored. It's had a major role in tuberculosis, foodborne illnesses, polio, tropical insect-borne diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, smallpox, and measles in the United States and abroad. Um, over time, we've also seen the gradual federalization of disaster relief, although disaster relief does remain centered in the states. Um, initially, there was not much of a system for this on the federal level. The way that disaster relief worked was that if there was a disaster, Congress would pass a special bill to provide some funding to help uh, recovery efforts through ad hoc legislation. The first such bill was passed in 1803. It was not until the 1930s that the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was established specifically to send out disaster loans uh, for businesses and individuals to recover. 
And up until fairly uh, recently in the 20th century, disaster relief was separated across multiple agencies. So the Bureau of Public Roads might step in in some kinds of disasters. The Army Corps of Engineers might help uh, with flood recovery. HUD might help with housing crises, et cetera. Uh, it was not until 1979 that FEMA was established to bring all of these different agencies together and to coordinate responses federally. Um, however, whenever we are thinking about the relationship um, uh, between the federal government and the states, we have to think about both the constitutional and the legislative framework and the limits of constitutional power. When we think about the limits of constitutional power, we need to keep in mind how the Constitution works. In Article I, it lays out the powers of Congress. In Article II, it lays out the powers of the executive branch. Congress then has the capacity to pass legislation that empowers the executive branch, branch to act. And the executive branch can act all the way out to the limits of its authority. So all the way out to the edge of those circles that I've drawn there. Uh, the executive branch has the power to act. And Congress has used this power pretty extensively, uh, passing the Defense Production Act in 1950, uh, which is routinely used in government contracts, uh, the Disaster Relief Act of 1974, the National Emergency Act of 1976, uh, the Stafford um, Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistant Act amendments to that in 1988, and then um, most recently the Homeland Security Act of 2002. This creates the federal legislative framework for helping with the disaster assistance. So how does this work in practice? Well, there are clear lines of responsibility. There are things that the federal government is supposed to be doing. The federal government is responsible for things like international disease monitoring and response, national disease monitoring and support for broad research, national border control of issues with infectious disease, the production of advisory guidelines for disaster response, uh, providing a national data clearinghouse where information is collected and distributed to those who need it on the state uh, and local levels. The federal government can be responsible for labor intensification. Uh, you think about something like the Army Corps of Engineers as an example. Uh, the federal government can change or suspend particular federal regulations in times of emergency. And the federal government is usually responsible for doing broad scale development and testing and production of things like vaccines and tests that are needed for response to infectious disease outbreaks. There are also some responsibilities, however, that clearly lie with the states. The states are responsible for the direct assessment of the disaster's impact. They are responsible for direct reporting to the proper federal agencies and the direct provision of disaster relief, although that relief may be funded and supported federally. They also carry a lot of primary leadership authority. They have to, uh, for instance, request emergency declarations from the federal government. And they continue to exercise their police power without specific legislative authorization. Uh, and they can commandeer certain kinds of power um, to, to uh, manage these problems by taking non-federal assets and putting them to the purpose of disaster uh, relief. They can also change and suspend state regulations. We've seen many examples of this in this crisis, but the most obvious one would be suspending the usual medical licensing requirements so that more people can come in and serve as first responders. And they can uh, implement state economic forbearance policies. Uh, again, something that we've seen happening in many states. Uh, however, I think what we want to be paying attention to uh, where we've seen some issues are these areas for collaboration between the federal government and the state. We expect the federal government and the states to be communicating about the situation, to be communicating about the needs that the states and localities have and about the resources that they have available to meet these needs. Um, we see the determination of which level is best equipped to resol resolve which problems as something where the federal government and the states should ideally be partnering. Travel regulations are often an area where authority is shared. 
coordination of scarce disaster related resources and coordination of the distribution of these resources is another area for collaboration. And we expect collaboration too in developing frameworks for administering both federal and state relief to the individuals, uh, businesses, and institutions that need it. What have we seen in this crisis? Well, we've seen, unfortunately, some federal failures. Uh, we've seen a lack of execution of some of those core federal responsibilities that I discussed a little bit earlier. Um, many, uh, many analysts believe that part of the problem here is that there's never been the appointment of a single lead federal official to coordinate all of the various federal agencies and to manage state and federal responses. We saw an example of this during the Ebola crisis with um, the appointment of Ron Klain as the, the single individual who was going to be responsible for managing all these responses. Um, we've also seen some collaboration collapses between uh, the federal government and the states where it seems like no one is really taking the responsibility needed. Who's responsible, for instance, for procuring uh, personal protective equipment? Who's responsible for producing the tests that are needed, um, both the tests to determine uh, who has COVID and the tests to determine uh, who has antibodies? Who's responsible for promulgating science-based guidelines for various health measures? Again, you don't see a, a clear line of responsibility in many instances. We've also seen struggles um, over responsibility. Uh, who's going to call the shots about reopening the economy? Who is going to have the final say on these things? What is to be done particularly about shared spaces? Uh, you can't open an airport without collaboration between the federal government and the states. You can't reopen and um, manage uh, traffic on federal highways without collaboration between the federal government and the states. If the states and the federal government disagree about reopening criteria, how much latitude are the states and regional compacts going to have to control matters? And finally, um, a rather disturbing one, who controls the data? Data has to be collected locally, but um, it has to be reported to the federal government and the federal government has to be able to collaborate effectively with those who are collecting the data to share the data and to use the same kinds of standards. Um, and at this point, we're seeing a, a lot of difficulty with national standards and testing availability, um, uh, leading to inconsistent um, stuttering results in this process. Uh, there have been other struggles at all, uh, as well. Um, we're seeing, unfortunately, some struggles between states and local authorities. Um, we're seeing, in some instances, cities trying to impose stricter standards than states and then being countermanded by governors. Uh, we saw that with uh, some coastal states in, in the southeast where a, a city uh, manager or city mayor uh, would want to close down a beach, but then the governor would want to reopen before that city was willing to take that step. We've seen some struggles uh, between state and local authorities over what is going to happen with schools, when they're going to be closed, how long they're going to be closed. And uh, I don't need to really say any more than to point you to the example of the struggles that have taken place between Mayor de Blasio in New York City and Governor Andrew Cuomo. Um, and at the same time, we've seen struggles between the states. Uh, there's been competition for resources, unfortunately, and we've had some struggles over travel restriction. Uh, a few weeks ago, there was a lot of outrage among many New Yorkers when they discovered that when they tried to cross state lines, they were being subjected to suspicion and often uh, mandatory quarant quarantines. But the shoe is likely to wind up on the other foot uh, down the road. What might we want to do in a month or so if our curve is finally going downward uh, while other states are going up? So how do we go forward from here? One really interesting phenomenon that has emerged uh, very quickly is this idea of regional compacts. Uh, Alfred Twu has done a great job of keeping track of these. Um, if you want to watch these things evolving, he's uh, been uh, posting practically daily updates on, on Twitter. But we see here um, organizations of multiple states who've agreed to coordinate their responses uh, and to manage things together and make decisions in coordination. 
Um, we are hoping to see more state leadership in many of these things. If the federal government is not able to perform its responsibilities effectively, uh, both regional compacts and state leadership can play an important role in helping to uh, create collaboration and move us toward um, safer uh, and more healthy times. And we can see the possibilities for states to lead and to collaborate with each other as the hotspots move from one area to another. States were collaborating with New York and helping New York as we were approaching our peak and now we are seeing that New York, for instance, has agreed to send ventilators to Massachusetts as Massachusetts is going to be approaching its peak in the near future. Um, but we're still seeing some significant problems. Um, there are different standards for restarting the economy. There's no one national standard and states disagree about how this is going to go forward. This creates potential political pressure for a sort of race to the bottom, uh, particularly um, in areas where we don't have regional compacts operating effectively. Furthermore, we're a nation that's networked into the world. Uh, and we need to remember that we are all as vulnerable as the most vulnerable among us. And finally, I think we need to remember, unfortunately, that right now we're taking the intermediate level course uh, in pandemic disease response. Uh, there could be a, a, a much more dire uh, final exam waiting for us around the corner. So it's important that we think about how we're going to manage these tensions uh, over federalism and tensions over state authority so that if we ever do have to take that final exam with a more infectious and more deadly agent, we can be sure to pass. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation and I'm looking forward to hearing questions. Great, Dr. Thank you so much for that. Um, if, if I could start out with a, um, a hypothetical and, and um, I know that's always dangerous to do, but if um, if Georgia says okay, we're we're gonna we're gonna open our 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 state early, um, do other states have the right to bar um, people from Georgia from coming in, or do do they have the right to quarantine them? I mean, was it where does the power lie between uh, the 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 ability to move um, interstate versus the state rights? It is a, a rather difficult issue. Um, again, states have traditionally had a great deal of authority to be able to protect the public health. That's one of the absolute core missions of the states, and it goes back to prior to the formation of the United States. Um, can the states uh, completely close down travel entirely? Probably not, but what they can do is if they have a reason to believe that their citizens will be put at risk from um, travelers who are carrying disease, they can certainly implement neutral regulations as long as they're implementing them with some sort of reasonable basis that, that is not overly restrictive. Thank you. And, and one final one. If I'm the president of the United States and you're the governor of um, California, do I have the right to tell you that you have to reopen your state? No. Do I have that type of authority? No, uh, the president can't order that directly. Uh, the president, of course, does have other tools that uh, the executive branch can use to try to encourage a governor to make the decisions that the president wants. But the president doesn't have the authority to override the state's police power in this instance. Thank you so much for that. So let me uh, let me see if I could call on Dr. Uh, Jennifer Goodall, uh, the, the Vice Dean for CEHC, uh, to see if we've got some questions in the queue. We do. Dean Holdgrave, what does testing too much really mean? And are you aware of any jurisdiction in the country where that has been a problem? Well, thanks for the question. It's, it's a great question. And uh, actually that phrasing was used by uh, Admiral Girard, who's on the White House uh, Coronavirus uh, Task Force, uh, and was talking a few days ago about sort of levels of testing in the United States, uh, and was, um, I, I, I don't know if he meant it's quite so literally about too much, but that, that was the wording that he used uh, when he talked about, you know, if you have maybe 20% positivity, uh, 
uh, you need to continue to test to try and move that down because you're still very much in a diagnostic mode uh, and you want to try and get that lower. And then he said, well, if, if you get down to like 1% uh, positivity, maybe you're testing too much. Um, and uh, I, I don't want to read too much or too little into his phrasing of the, of the word too much. Uh, but I think you raise a really good point in that I don't know of any um, uh, country uh, or any jurisdiction in the United States uh, that has had what I would call too much testing. If anything, I think we're uh, continuing to uh, ramp up uh, both globally as well as uh, more locally. Um, and when we think about even just here in, in New York, um, we're kind of still doing CDC priority one testing for persons who are uh, hospitalized and symptomatic or healthcare workers. We have to be able to get to everyone uh, who is, um, has an underlying health condition, who's symptomatic, maybe lives in a nursing home, and even persons with mild symptoms who live in areas with uh, heightened uh, community levels of transmission. So um, uh, I, uh, maybe at some point, uh, someday we'll see too much testing, but uh, at this point, I, I wouldn't exactly know how to define that, or nor do I think we're uh, in any danger of getting, uh, uh, getting close to that at this point. But thank you, it's a great question. Well, Jen, before we move on to the next question, um, I wanted to answer a question from last week's um, episode. And, and remember, all of these town halls are on YouTube. Um, and in fact, we'll, we'll post the clip again for you if you're interested in, in going back and, and taking a look at, at other sessions. Um, it, it, it's all uh, on YouTube. The question last week that I couldn't answer was um, whether students, um, particularly UAlbany students, would be eligible for um, the, the federal payment of $1,200. Um, and what we found out is that any person who's between the age of 17 and 24 who is claimed as a dependent won't be eligible for the $1,200 payment or be eligible for the $500 bonus. So thanks everybody for being patient to get that answer. Um, Jen, back to you now for the next question. Sure, so um, based on the declination in these rates, how do those data break down relative to gender and race? Thanks. That's uh, also another great question. And I think um, uh, Dean Gallant uh, answered uh, this question in the Q&A uh, to uh, a degree too. And I wanted to agree with uh, Dean uh, Gallant's uh, answer. Um, in, uh, for New York State, if we're looking at this, if we go to uh, covid19tracker.health.ny.gov, um, if you go to their uh, website, you can click on fatality uh, information and um, that's, the inf that's the statistic right now where we have the best information by gender and race ethnicity. Um, I really hope that um, we continue to improve in terms of getting more um, information uh, by gender and race ethnicity uh, for cases, for tests, and so on. We need a much uh, further elaboration of the data there. But if you go to the fatality rate uh, data, the first thing that you notice if we uh, break this out by gender and it's cumulative, so we don't have it for the last few days, like I was talking about at the outset, what the um, numbers of deaths per day are. They don't break it out by day uh, yet on this website. Um, but we see that almost 60% of the deaths are among men and about 40% are among women. And um, uh, that seems to be holding up pretty much um, uh, in our experience so far with the epidemic. Um, more fatalities are men uh, than women around 60, 40, something like that. And then if we look by race and ethnicity, uh, if you go to the uh, same website, they first report for the entire state overall, um, the percent of the population who's African American, who's Latinx, white, uh, Asian, and other Pacific Islander. Um, they don't report separately by Native American communities, which is an uh, important uh, issue that needs to be addressed. But then if you click on uh, to see New York uh, State um, they exclude New York City, the age-adjusted uh, death rates, which uh, helps to uh, uh, take into account um, uh, the rates uh, per 100,000 population. And if we go to the rates per 100,000 population, again, this is the state outside of the city, um, for Hispanic communities, it's about 51.8. Uh, for Black, uh, 58.6. And White, 14.3. Uh, so when you look at these fatality rates um, uh, in its cases per 100,000, uh, you really see, see an enormous difference. Um, and uh, that's probably where it's uh, most clear. And uh, this is an area that we have to address. And I'm very proud that um, 
New York State recently asked President Rodriguez and the university um, is starting to put together a team uh, to work with President Rodriguez to start to uh, address these health disparities. And we'll see uh, further detail as that project uh, continues to unfold. Um, but we have to not only identify these disparities, but think about how we build health equity in response as well. So thank you very much for the question. Yeah, do we have some other questions? We do. Um, so the next question is for Dr. Novkov. Your discussion of the tensions didn't really contemplate what happens if there isn't good faith to, to resolve conflicts, e.g. the president promulgating criteria for reopening states that aren't met by certain swing states with Democratic governors, and then egging on protests against the shutdowns there. And the alliances of states you showed on your maps mostly are of similar party governors, which may be okay, dot, dot, dot. Can you speak to that? Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. Um, and I agree, it, it is problematic that we have this tension between uh, the president and the governors, uh, particularly between the president and governors in democratic states. Um, I do think that these regional compacts, however, do bring us some hope that things might be able to develop into somewhat better directions. Uh, some of the compacts, right, if you look on the West Coast, of course, those are all Democratic governors, but we're seeing some collaboration between governors of different parties, particularly in the Midwest, but uh, to a lesser extent in the Northeast as well. Uh, so there are some Republican governors in the mix and uh, collaborating with Democratic governors to come up with plans for reopening their states in a responsible way. Uh, I understand that there has been a lot of media coverage of these protests um, and they have gotten a, a great deal of interest from the public. However, it's important to remember that if you look at um, opinion polls of the American public, overwhelmingly people are in favor of maintaining social distancing until scientific authorities are telling us that it is safe to ease up on the, sh the restrictions. So um, I think it's important not to get too taken into this, uh, this kind of spectacle that's being created, um, which is certainly interesting for the news media to cover, but doesn't necessarily tell us that much about the kind of support that individual governors have for the policies that they're putting forward. If we look, in fact, at um, approval ratings for the governors, in these states, we see that all of them are experiencing very strong support from their state citizens for both for the collaboration that they're doing in these regional compacts and for the policies that they put into place in their own states. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're in a time and place where um, any jackrabbit with a with a bullhorn seems to be able to get onto one of the uh, one of the 24-hour media shows. Uh, that that's an excellent point about the the, um, the polling that we're seeing with uh, with our elected officials. Um, Dr. Goodall, another question. Sure, sort of a related question. Do you believe that the coordination between the states and federal government will vastly improve when the disease disease starts to decline? Well, generally, I'm a pretty optimistic person. <laughs> Um, but right now, I, I, it doesn't look like things are going to get enormously better. I think we can hope for a little bit, at least less bumpiness in the federal response. Um, if we do see um, states and these compact groups beginning to take the lead and um, taking control of testing and coming up with good policies, we can see the sharing of these policies both within state compacts and across the different compact groups. And that might, um, in effect, create some models where hopefully the federal government will be willing to follow along and then promulgate those models to states that are, are lagging behind. That's, uh, that's about the most optimistic picture that I can provide for you. Thank you. Our next question, is there a possibility that we will see immunity passports in the US as has been discussed in other countries? Uh, is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? I suspect it's not very likely. Um, Americans are not terribly fond of nationally implemented uh, and managed um, 
forms of identity. Uh, we do have uh, US passports, but that's about it. There have been conversations about national ID going on for quite a while. Um, and again, I think one of the problems would be how do you set up this kind of system so that you have one uh, single standard for what would entitle someone to have um, an immunity passport? How would we deal with um, whether these passports are to be available to citizens only, uh, to all legal residents? What do we do for undocumented residents? There would be a lot of political problems that would have to be worked out. Um, so I think that if we see anything like this, we're much more likely to see it on the state level than on the national level. Yeah, if I could jump in on that one as well. I mean, the federal government has been been trying to push this idea of a real ID since um, after 9-11, and, and it's still not in place. And for any of you that, like me, paid the extra money to get the enhanced uh, the enhanced driver's license in order to, to continue to be able to use it at the airport, un understand that pain. So if the federal government was going to try to implement something like this, it, it would probably be in place for the great, 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 great grandchildren of this virus, because there is no way the federal government can move quickly enough to institute something something like this, at least uh, given what we've seen um, post 9-11. Okay, thank you. What are your views on the correlations between BCG vaccine and reduced COVID-19 susceptibility. Is this real? Oh, thanks. Uh, another great uh, question. Um, I, I think that uh, at, at the moment, the uh, relationship between BCG vaccine um, and COVID-19 seems to be correlational. So the studies that seem to get attention in this area first, uh, we're looking at for countries that require BCG vaccine, uh, what was um, the rate of COVID-19 looking like and compared to the countries that didn't require uh, BCG. And when one first did that kind of correlational look at a country level, it seemed like maybe there was some relationship there. Um, WHO uh, a few days ago, about a week ago, came out with a statement saying that uh, they had looked at um, the issue of BCG vaccine and COVID-19 and they don't feel like there is yet evidence uh, of a relationship there. Um, there's a couple of clinical trials that are now started that are underway um, that WHO is going to be keeping an eye on and looking forward to more uh, evidence. So I think we have um, uh, some uh, kind of ecological level correlational analysis that's given us a hint there. Um, WHO is not yet convinced that that's a real causal relationship. Uh, and there's some clinical trials that are underway that we'll all have to keep an eye on. But thank you, it's a great question. Thank you. What is the association between behavioral risk factors such as smoking on the incidence and prevalence of the disease and related mortality rates? Uh, sure, I can uh, maybe at least uh, partially answer that uh, question. I think that uh, so far, uh, there's a sense that uh, smoking, uh, at least combustible cigarettes, seems to have uh, a fairly clear relationship uh, to uh, progression of more severe disease with COVID-19. Uh, and there's two things that people are worried about. The first, of course, uh, and most clearly is lung function and that persons who are smoking comb combustible cigarettes are more likely to have uh, lung challenges and then uh, only exacerbated by COVID-19. Um, the other thing which people are starting to uh, worry about a bit, too, is just modes of transmission. Uh, so if you're uh, touching a, a surface that's been commonly touched by someone else, smoking a cigarette, bringing your hand closer to your mouth and your lips and so on, uh, there might be more uh, behavioral patterns that could lead to um, uh, transmission. I think that's still getting some attention, but the issue of lung function is really uh, key. Um, I think there's a little bit um, more mixed evidence so far looking at uh, vaping and e-cigarettes, um, but clearly there's a, a good theoretical reason to be worried about that with lung function and what that lung, diminished lung function might mean in terms of COVID-19. Um, but I think the, the case, the feeling uh, by WHO and others so far is the case around combustible cigarettes is even clearer and a bit stronger, but they're also uh, trying to look at e-cigarettes and vaping as well too.
If I could jump in um, with a, actually a follow-up question, um, Dean Holgrave, we've talked in the in the past sessions about herd immunity, um, and I, I know it was one of the things that we talked we would bring up again tonight. And so before we ran out of time, do you have any um, any any more um, insights into the question of herd immunity? Yeah, you know, I think it still remains an open issue. I, um, uh, not to beg the question, but I think we'll come back to it again. Yeah, and I will continue to ask. <laughs> it will continue. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think part of the reason for that is um, uh, when we talk about herd immunity, we often think about um, herd immunity maybe uh, setting in if we have 40, 50, 60 percent of the population uh, who becomes infected with a particular virus or uh, or, or disease and. Uh, even in areas uh, like in, uh, we're just now learning about what the community level prevalence of COVID-19 is. And um, uh, recently in California, they did one of the first true community-wide uh, zero surveys to look at un underlying prevalence. And for that particular um, uh, city, and I believe it was Santa Clara, if my memory serves, um, they were at about three to 4% of the population uh, they believe had uh, experience with uh, this new novel coronavirus. And so when we talk about, it, even that seems high, we think, wow, three to 4% of the population had coronavirus. Um, but when we talk about herd immunity, we're usually thinking about much larger percentages of the population. So uh, thankfully, uh, we haven't had that level of experience with it yet. Uh, so it's a, an area that we continue to chase to try and really understand uh, what that means. I think also we're continuing to learn more and more about what happens if someone um, seems to clear the virus, uh, but then test positive again later. There's been uh, some of those cases reported in the literature, people really trying to understand, is it accuracy of the test? Is it that there's um, detection of some virus uh, particles, but not enough to maybe reinfect the person? How long does their own uh, immunity last with antibodies. It seems like it provides some protection, but for how long and, and what's the strength of that protection? Uh, I think those are still open empirical questions that people are working hard on. Thank you. Dr. Goodall? How will COVID-19 affect the summer? For example, do you believe the beaches at the Jersey Shore will be closed? Uh, well, I think it's, a, it's an important question. I think uh, rather than uh, I don't know that I have an opinion of one particular uh, set of uh, beaches, uh, but I think we can look to these uh, uh, reopening criteria, if you will, that the White House came up with, uh, the gating criteria, and then uh, phase one, phase two, and phase three, and so on. And I think that um, it, it's not until you get to really phase two and phase three um, that you really are supposed to get to the place where you're having widespread opening of large public areas and public venues uh, without a lot of attention to social distancing. It's really in phase three that that happens and to a much more limited extent in phase two. Um, so to get there from where we're at now, and especially given that uh, New Jersey and New York are both heavily impacted areas, we have to meet all those gating criteria we talked about before. We're probably a few weeks away from being able to get through all of those gating criteria. Then we get through phase one, which is still um, having a number of people in society, uh, especially who are more vulnerable, staying at home, uh, people more still uh, teleworking if they can, uh, much limited set of opening of venues, but very slowly, lots of physical distancing. Uh, and then we have to get uh, to phase two and finally to three before we see widespread opening of beaches, uh, unless people want to just skip the steps, like which we just saw in uh, Florida, for instance, recently, where um, uh, there was just kind of uh, moved quickly, I forget which city in Florida, uh, to just open the beaches on certain hours and it was supposed to be for um, physical exercise only uh, and everyone was supposed to maintain their distance, but there were plenty of music houses where people were getting uh, much too close uh, on those areas. So, um, I, you know, I, I think we're a few steps away and especially we talk about heavily impacted areas like uh, New Jersey and New York, we may be, uh, may be well into the summer before that's a reality. Thank you. We have a couple of questions about masks, so I'll put the uh, two together. To what effect does wearing an N95 mask and wearing sunglasses have against COVID-19? And another mask question is, do you think face masks 
are really a help? If so, do they need to have a filter or is a cloth mask okay? Uh, thanks. Also, also great questions. Um, you know, the uh, guidance around masks seems to have evolved quite a bit as we've gone through the course of the pandemic. Uh, early on, uh, there was clearly an emphasis from CDC and others that we should think about, um, especially N95 masks, which would be more protective uh, of someone becoming infected with coronavirus. Um, it, reserving those for healthcare workers who really need, needed them and who were exposed quite a bit to coronavirus. Uh, and then also for persons who tested positive um, to help avoiding transmission um, to other people. And I'm kind of merging the answers together of these two, two questions. Um, I think uh, now with CDC's guidance about uh, everyone and, and in New York as well, it's a requirement if you're out and you can't uh, have a physical distance of six or more feet, you're supposed to have a mask in New York State, and that's consistent with what CDC, I think, is saying now. Um, one way to think about this is what the Surgeon General says, which I think is a, a useful framing. If you have a, a cloth mask like a bandana that you tie around your face and it covers your nose and it covers your mouth, um, it, it's not going to be the most effective thing in the world uh, for helping protecting you uh, from becoming infected with coronavirus if someone, say, is coughing very close to you, very near to you, because there certainly are pathways around that uh, bandana to get to uh, your mucosal membranes, to get to your mouth, to get to your nose, and so on. Um, in you know, N95 masks, you really have to fit very carefully to your face, and those are, are the best thing. Um, but the Surgeon General really frames this as if, you're, if all of us said to protect the community, um, we have to recognize that we might be an asymptomatic carrier of now a coronavirus. So uh, it's possible that someone doesn't have symptoms, they feel perfectly fine, they're not really sure uh, if they've been exposed. But if we all make the assumption that we could be asymptomatic carriers, which may or may not be true, and we all wear a mask, uh, for persons who are asymptomatic, the mask actually will be very helpful in avoiding transmission to someone else. If you cough, if you sneeze, if you breathe very hard in someone's direction um, and you're close to them, um, having uh, even a cloth bandana is gonna help catch some of those droplets, catch some of those particles. So it's imperfect, absolutely. It's kind of a form of harm reduction uh, and much more likely to disrupt asymptomatic transmission from someone living with the virus. And I think if we frame it in that way, um, and the Surgeon General uh, talks about this a lot as uh, a, a form of respect for the whole community to wear it. I, I think that's a useful frame, probably. It's somewhat ironic that a month and a half ago, if you had worn a mask walking into a store, they would have called the police. And now if you walk into a store without wearing a mask, they call the police. I think yeah. we have time for one final question, if, if it could, Dr. Goodall. Sure. So our last one is for Dr. Nalkov. What advice would you give to the president about dealing with the pandemic? Um, my advice would be to work a lot harder on collaborating with the states and with the governors and with the compacts to make sure that the federal government is both fulfilling its responsibilities and that it is supporting the states in their efforts to control this pandemic. And on that note, I would like to thank everybody for again attending the, this town hall and, and welcome you back next week at the same bat time and same bat channel. Um, on behalf of President Rodriguez and, and Prevost Kim, on behalf of our panelists, Dean David Holtgrave, Dr. Julie Novkov, I'm Dean Bob Griffin. Um, I'm going to leave you with our, our typical sign off. Remember, hate the virus, love the people. Have a safe week and hope to see you back next time next week. Good night, everybody.